Hey everybody, welcome to the Salmon Trout Steel Header Podcast. I am Lucas, and you will be hearing from Pro Escobedo today about ocean coho fishing and some excellent information on conditions and fishing rigs. Really good info from Pro Escobedo, a guide and owner of VIP Outdoors. This episode of the Salmon Trout Steel Header Podcast is brought to you by Al's Goldfish Lure Company which are coming up on 70 years of making beautiful spoons for trolling and casting. Owlsgoldfish.com. And now, the interview with Pro Escobedo. Okay, everybody, we're on the Salmon Trout Steelheader Podcast, and I have a special guest. I'm down here at the Saltwater Sportsman Show, and I have Pro Escobedo of VIP Outdoors. Thank you, Pro, for being on the podcast. Not a problem, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Pro is here at the show with a big, beautiful boat and a bunch of products that I was um, taking a look at. Looks like some phenomenal products, but you're uh, a guy, first and foremost. Right. You know, I think <laughs> the company that we built at VIP Outdoors is really all about the outdoors. And it did start with the guiding. We have our own line of custom salmon tackle that has become very popular over the last few years. And then we also have some different facets uh, within the company, whether it be hunting, whether it be our instructional cooking videos, our process, game processing videos, things like that. So it's really... A full outdoor company but we do have an emphasis on fishing here in the Northwest because that's what I do for a living awesome so do you have do you work with other guides Is I do yeah okay. so within our pro staff we have 12 different guides and we all fish common water but we all have our own specialties as well so for example all of us fish buoy 10 but if you wanted to fish the ocean you'd give me a call and I'd take you out in our big ocean boat if you wanted to walleye fish you'd give me a call and we'd send you out with Brian Jones from takedown guide service if you wanted to fish up in Alaska we'd send you up with Randy Seals so we're able to handle a larger clientele and have more of a versatile spread I guess when it comes to targeting different fish in the northwest just so we don't pin people down to a certain fishery. One of the fisheries that you mentioned there that you do is ocean coho. Why don't you tell us a little bit about first of all last year which would have been the 2019 summer ocean coho season as compared to the last couple years and the fluctuations you've seen in fishing. You know, you're going to see some variations. So again, within our pro staff, we fish everywhere from Winchester all the way up to the uh, Astoria, um, I guess, break, if you will. And we do. We do see that fluctuation depending on what takes place with ocean conditions. We see the largest fluctuation with the amount of native in comparison to hatchery coho. And there are a lot of factors when you're talking about coho. There's such a easily manipulated fish when it comes to conditions, whether it be a wind, whether it be a current, whether it be a temperature, that you might find them one day and then the next day they're just non-existent in that area and you got to go find them again. So what are you going to look for um, in terms of ideal conditions, if you could describe ideal ocean coho conditions? If I'm talking about ideal conditions, fishing out of Astoria for me, number one, I'm looking for that west-northwest wind. As soon as we get that southerly wind, it blows those coho everywhere and they become very, very difficult to find. Uh, when it's blowing out of the Northwest, I instantly drop lines as soon as I can. As soon as I get to the CR buoy, I'm dropping stuff. And then I just point it West. One of the biggest things I have found when I'm targeting coho is that I'm always going with the stronger of two forces, whether it be the wind or the tide. So whichever way I'm naturally flowing, that's the way I troll. And even if I have to turn on my main motors and come run laps, I feel that I'm much more successful doing that opposed to going against the grain. And would you say that's just due to how your, how your lures and baits are presenting or do you think the fish are following that as well? Well, I think it's, it's more of a presentation thing. We got to remember with fish, they always point into pressure. So when you have a fish that's pointing into the current and you're going down current on them, whether it be a tide influence, the wind influence, because I, I think that wind influence on the top surface of the water is something that's very commonly overlooked. So when you have that wind blowing out of the northwest or maybe the north and it's blowing south, sometimes that's going to be your strongest force on that surface current. So when you start riding that, you're going to find that the fish are pointing into that. Therefore, you're dragging your gear into more sets of fish, which is an ideal situation. Where do you usually find ocean coho in relation to depth? I'm a surface guy when you're talking about coho. In the morning or overcast days, I'm really targeting the upper columns, which I consider 10 to 20 feet are what I consider uh, the, the uppers. 
as the day gets brighter and the sun starts to come up, I do move the gear down slowly. I'm lucky enough to be able to fish four to six rods every day, so I do have a good stagger, but there's multiple times where I've caught fish with 10 feet on the line counter all the way down to 30. If you had one rod to fish, I'd probably split the difference and go 17, 19 feet on the line counter, 16 ounces of lead, and wait for it to pop over. Okay, so in terms of once you find that perfect depth and you find the fish, what, what do you rely on for if you had one ocean salmon rig to run? what would that be? I would honestly say one of what we call our Alaska spinners. Our Alaska spinners, we tie on a tube fly. We crimp 80 pound mono. We're able to switch our blades in and out quickly to figure out what color they want. And then I just put a little piece of chunk bait on there. And that chunk bait on the back, whether it be an anchovy sardine, I just brine it up so it's nice and hard. And you get, you stimulate absolutely everything that a coho is looking for. You're, you're doing color, you're doing feel, you're doing scent. And one of those things, those three things are going to cause that coho to snap at it. That sounds deadly. Now, is that something you run in the river as well? In Astoria, what I consider the big water, I do. When I come up river, those fish seem to get a little bit shy about it because it is a pretty aggressive setup on 80 pound leader. Mm -hmm. But with these, we're able to literally handle fish without putting them in the net. And again, it's called our Alaska spinner where having to shift through natives and hatchery fish isn't a big deal so we're literally able to just handline the fish over the side of the boat wow that's pretty phenomenal so when it comes to um, uh, ocean coho salmon and in particular if you're fishing barbless or something what would you recommend as far as hook types and profiles to keep a fish on i'm a big fan of obviously in the ocean we got to do a single hook correct uh there are no troubles that we can use when we're targeting salmon the big river is a good hook. It has a nice deep break to it. Uh, the owner Siwash is one of the, my go-tos consistently. Sometimes I think people maybe underhook, and when I say underhook, undersize the size of hook we use in the ocean. When you think about a coho, a lot of people talk about two or three yachts. When I'm fishing a Siwash in the ocean, I fish a, a five op Siwash, which seems like a very big hook, but these fish are not afraid of size out there. Mm -hmm. And when you have that that larger profile that deeper point and wider gap in that hook you're going to get into more cartilage of the fish's mouth mm -hmm. therefore you're going to lose less fish i did notice looking at i believe it was it a 3.0 spinner that had a rather large hook on it mm -hmm. and it i wouldn't normally think that size of hook for that spinner but as soon as i saw it i just went okay that makes sense yeah that and large hook hanging back there it's going to get that fish right right and those are usually surrounded by one of the squids or hoochies that we use in that profile of a, a, a spinner and so as far as those fish being line shy being they're not shy they're feeding out there they're an aggressive fish we've all seen it where a group of them come up with one that you have and they're pecking at different things on the line they are not a shy fish so getting that right hook that hook that maybe you think is too big is actually the right size that's awesome i never thought about it that way but um, i know in my limited experience in the ocean i have had a couple of coho grab it right at the boat mm -hmm. spinner when you're reeling it up absolutely so they are aggressive as all get out kind of switching gears here, I do know that you do some tuna, is that mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Some albacore tuna here off the Pacific coast. And what have you seen in, as far as the fluctuations in that season and how far out they are in the, the currents over, say, the past five years or however long you've been doing it? Yeah, so what's your friend in the coho business is not your friend in the tuna world and vice versa. So we're talking about those southerly winds messing up the coho bite, but what that does is that brings warm water from the south that encourages tuna to come in closer to our shore, number one, but also pushes them further north. So there's some years, like last year, excuse me, last year was a phenomenal tuna year, and we had a large period of southerly winds that was pushing that warm ocean temperature north. The year before that, we didn't have those winds. So the tuna fishing was tough out of Astoria, Owaco. You go down to Charleston and it's a different, a different scenario. So I usually start my tuna season down at the end of June, first two weeks of July in the Charleston fishery. And then when I come home up to Astoria here, I'm able to focus on salmon from August 1st. Now that can be frustrating because I know people were going out and 
catching tuna like crazy on August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd when uh, we were salmon fishing. It just, when you're guiding, you have to commit to one thing and that's what you do. But, uh, so, you know, last year I actually didn't get a tuna season even though it was a phenomenal tuna year. You know, my two weeks of end of June and into July, the tuna weren't here yet. Well, thank you so much for all the information about ocean fishing, coho salmon, and tuna. Uh, thanks for stopping by to do the Salmon Trout Steel Editor podcast with me, Pro. And uh, if, if you want to let people know where they can find out about your products and your guide. Absolutely. So everything we do can be found at VIPoutdoors.com. That's my website. You'll have all of our contact information on there. You'll be able to look at all the guides on the pro staff and what they specialize in. All of our products can be ordered there. All of our how-to videos can be found there. All of our cooking recipes, absolutely everything is on our website at VIPoutdoors.com. Perfect, thank you, bro. Not a problem, thank you for having me.